Uh, welcome back, everyone, to another Sporting Blog podcast. <clears throat> um, it's unusual that we will publish two in two days, but uh, the way the calendar has fallen and the chance to speak to some fun guests, uh, it was too good a chance to turn up. Uh, today, I do have uh, an extremely fun guest, um, someone I'd like to call a friend now, um, Andy Payne, or in full title, actually, Andy Payne OBE, I should I should properly say. Um, nice to see you, Andy, because I'm just for the listeners. We are we are visual on, on camera, but for you listeners, you can only hear us. But how are you going? I'm well, thanks, Ollie. And uh, yeah, we are friends. That's good to, uh, that's, that's the truth. Uh, less said about that ancient honour system, the better in my book. This yeah. is one of the things that me and David Beckham share. I think it's probably love of football as well. And the fact that... Um, my cousin uh, was in his football team at school. There you go, in Chingford. But that's nice. it. That's enough of that. Yeah. Um, we will actually come on to football later because we both have the... Our, our thing in common is that we both support dubious London football teams in terms of current standards anyway. Um, and uh, I think we'll get into that. But um, for people listening who don't know and who haven't Googled it because they're driving or whatever... Um, Andy, amongst many other things, uh, and, and actually in the capacity that I met him, um, is the chairman of the British Esports Association. I'll, I'll let him fill in the blanks on the other bits and pieces that he does. But suffice to say, Andy, you, you've been involved in video games since the 80s, I believe. Is that, is that accurate? That's right, Ollie. 1985 is officially the, the first time I entered the video games industry. Um, we used to call it the computer and video games. Um, industry. And Great friends, magazine, like, by the way. Compute yeah, CVG. Uh, I'm, CVG. I mean, I'm sure we'll get on to this. This is nostalgia. I mean, this is going to be a nostalgia cast for CVG. Well, wow. Yeah. And my friends always used to laugh at me because most of my mates um, at the time and now all do what I would call solid jobs, you know, like plumbers, chippies, working banks, that sort of stuff. And uh, I used to refer to the, game, the, game, the video games industry. And they'd all go, industry, Andy. How is it an industry? How, you know, it sounds like sort of, you know, the chemical industry or the high and steel industry or car industry. But yeah, well, it is. Well, what I didn't realise back then when I was blowing the, the industry's chump trumpet was that, you know, it would grow into this humongous global industry. And I'm proud to say the UK is a leading light both in terms of the creativity um some of the biggest video games on the planet are made uh by teams in the uk um the biggest i suppose being grand theft auto and one to one to five and six yeah. is being worked on um red dead redemption of course um football manager which is uh, you know a huge game it's actually a very sorry to interrupt you a very yeah. interesting point i think people probably naturally assume because of the those game settings that they're that they're made in the states um i remember years ago I, you probably remember this there was a there was a game a, a gangster game that was set in london uh, i can't remember what it was called but get, get away that was it get away yeah and at the time it was it's very, it makes you very proud when you're driving around your own city sort of thing and of course the the gtas are are mock-ups of of places yeah. like well miami and vice city and and, and los angeles etc um, but yeah, I mean, probably people don't realise that those mega, mega titles and Red Dead, of course, you know, another one set in the States were made here. What, um, just on that sort of note about the things we do well, did, did we always do things well in the UK in the games industry? Were we a forerunner always or have we developed into it as, as the industry always. itself has grown? Always. I think the, you know, if you, if you look at the kind of the genetic beginning of the video games, comes from Japan and from the US, okay? But the UK has always been interested. And the main reason for that, Ollie, was that two things. Firstly, the home computing revolution that, that I was proud to be part of. So some of the older listeners may remember the Sinclair Spectrum. Uh, they may remember the Commodore 64, yep. that T16 before it. And they may remember Alan Sugar's Amstrad machines, which were actually originally built as word processing machines, but, but we, we managed to get games running on them. 
because of those machines and the access that we had and because of the grand old BBC who had their own computers, uh, BBC Micro, mm -hmm. and, and had a national program for teaching what we used to call coding back then. It meant there was a lot of kids, and it has to be said, mainly boys, um, that figured out stuff in their bedrooms and built games. Um, interesting, another fun fact is that there is, at the last count, I think 19 sets of brothers that I know who have all had massive careers in the games industry, all from the UK. And they're at obviously, stating the obvious, they're at least two brothers, but sometimes three. And those brothers um, all come from the mid to late 80s and early 90s and all still work in the games industry today. Oh. Um, and the, the, the fun fact is that because um, brothers of our generation generally didn't have their own bedrooms, but, they, you know, like there'd be two brothers sleeping in the same room. They kind of knew each other, you know, well. And one would deal with the coding. So one would be good at maths. And one would deal with the art because one was not necessarily a choice as in to make a game, you needed to code and you needed to have good pictures, mm -hmm. even though that kind of bites back in those days, uh, sprites, uh, sprites, I should say, but, but the, couple, the two brothers or three brothers figure it out between them. And because they could work with each other, cause they like brothers always know each other very well. Uh, making games is super tough and it always has been, and it always will be. So it's a kind of interesting, accident i suppose and the uk has always been like punched really above its weight in terms of the creative industries and that that's borne out today you know that our theater tradition which hopefully the covid crisis won't won't kill our theater tradition our fashion our music um you know i'm sure if you'd interviewed somebody from one of the 60s bands like led zeppelin or the rolling stones or the kinks or someone like that um, they, you know, you might have said, well, why do you lot all sing like you're Americans? And the fact is because that's what got you in the, in the charts back then and got you a deal. And, you know, the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin, sort of two enormous bands, iconic bands known around the world still today, are, you know, based on the blues, which was an American form of music. So, you know, like all these things, they, they mix up. The UK still punches very high but then there are loads of other amazing teams from all over the world and the great thing about the video games industry and the esports industry it is absolutely global so we're not necessarily bothered by borders yeah. we're bothered about talent and we're bothered about making great games that people can play together for a very long time and really get into it and really enjoy it and all the communities that go around that stuff i mean uh, it it's uh, really interesting you bring up the the program that that well, okay so i'm i'm thinking when when i was still at school would have been uh, when i can think of this would have been 88 or 89 that i would have i remember we had computer lessons in inverted commas and yep. we were taught i don't know if you remember there was a programming language that allowed you to draw shapes called logo Yes, and you, you, you would, you would, you would pro program in, go forward this number of, I presume it was by pixels. I don't know. You'd say forward X, you know, right Y, and you could get it to do all sorts of very complex patterns. Yeah. And we would learn that at school. And what was interesting is that it probably did. I mean, I was, a, I was really into computers when I was a kid. Games actually for me came later. I was more interested in how the whole thing worked. Um, but... I don't know if this is still the case. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that kids don't don't learn coding as as part of a normal curriculum. But well, let me, you, let, let, let me let me tell you how it is now because it's yeah. quite an interesting. What one should know history in order to learn. Uh, that's the theory, anyway. Um, humans don't tend to do that. But <laughs> so when you were at school, you were probably on the on the beginning and the end of coding was being taught. You know, in classrooms. What happened was sometime in the early 90s, a very big software company that still exists today and will remain nameless, but they've got software stuff like Teams, right? <laughs> they basically figured out that they needed globally to get into schools with their software. Right. And, yeah. and what happened was, I don't think this was a particularly like a plot, but basically 
what we had in schools were we were originally we were being taught about how to make sprites move around a screen you know that's what we were taught and that was called coding you know you wrote a line of code it was an instruction to move something on the screen effectively in 2d okay and some sometime later that got replaced by ICT, you know, and, yeah. and IT, where kids were then being asked to learn about things like PowerPoint and Excel and Word and stuff like that. Now, you know, it doesn't take a genius to see that we've been gaslit, frankly, from learning how to create to learning how to use tools. And there is a difference there. And actually, you, you, you've got a kind of a journey from being a creator which is something that you know we both are frankly to being a consumer and we're both consumers too but if you're not careful if the journey only ends up with you being a consumer of entertainment then you will consume what other people and groups want you to consume or put out there for you to consume yeah and i think it's a hell it, so so we've now come back since 2011 we've now come back to understanding in the UK that uh, empowering you know, young people to create um, is really, really important. And you've seen that young people have never needed any excuse to do this. I mean, nowadays, creating on YouTube and creating on TikTok and stuff like that is just a given, okay? You know, it, it, everybody does it. Everyone's always created. It's just a question of how you've been able to harness that. And we're seeing in the digital revolution that we're in, which is amazing. We're seeing that this can be done at scale and it can be done cross border and cross community, cross language, cross everything. And frankly, that is quite a challenge for older people to get their heads around because, you know, if you look at the world of sport, um, it's always been pretty, pretty linear. In other words, if Man United and Man City want to play football with each other, they sort of got to turn up in a place with, the, with their teams and play each other. There's not really any other way of doing it. But what you've seen since lockdown is, you know, football players jumping onto, to like, let's say FIFA and playing that, tennis players playing tennis online. And I think most kind of importantly, um, uh, racing, you know, uh, uh, not horse racing, uh, car racing. Um, you've got kind of sim racing now has become pretty big. Uh, Le Mans was uh, completely online. So viewers were not going to Le Mans or watching Le Mans. They were watching the Le Mans drivers driving uh, and virtual drivers driving, um, you know, the, the simulation. Um, that's not ever going to replace the real stuff because let's face it, the real stuff's so good. But what it's kind of saying to a lot of us is this stuff is here to, to stay and it's going to get bigger. And it's a whole different world. Um, you know, just looking at sort of top esports teams, difficult this year because this year's been such a write off for everybody. But if you go back to last year, from memory, you know, third, fourth, or fifth of, um, the, you know, the kind of biggest earners in, you know, top teams of esports, I, I, I'd have to check, but Paris, uh, Team Paris Saint Germain esports right so a football team effectively yeah. was in the top five of earners last year and what were they playing well yes fifa but also dota 2 so mm -hmm. you can see now that, that sort of brands um are it's interesting you've got a football club right who probably i don't even know if paris saint germain have got a women's team they should have but who knows but football clubs specifically have taken a very, very long time to get women's teams. Not all, not all Premier League teams have got women's uh, teams, for example. Oh, well, right? Definitely not official women's teams. I mean, Spurs, no. for example, had Spurs women for ages. They weren't even, they didn't have the sponsor on the thing. It was, yeah. it was completely separate. It, and, and, and basically, you've got teams who, uh, yeah, clubs, that have taken a very long time to branch slightly sideways into, you know, women's teams, for example. Those clubs now... Because they're global brands, those clubs are now aware that they've got to really ensure that they're, they're across a lot of other areas. And because we work digitally and because we have no real borders, frankly, outside of China, in other words, you can connect up with everybody in the world pretty easily. Um, it means that all bets are off. You know, it means that the whole world's changed and the enlightened clubs 
um, and brands, I call them brands really rather than clubs, will start to realise this real quickly and, and figure out what their strategy is going to be. I mean, on that, that note, I mean, you're talking about commercialization and, you know, you mentioned at the very beginning of, of, the, of the chat, the, your, your mates were used to laugh at the, the industry and now it's this behemoth, you know, quite likely bigger than the movie industry in its entirety, if not already. When, when in your opinion, did you see the, well, let's, let's phrase it a different way. When, when did people start making money playing video games first? Because uh, as you know from the history of sport, you don't commercialize sport until the players are paid properly and audiences are attending to watch people who are better than them at something. That's the premise of all entertainment. Um, when was it that you, you saw, uh, was there an obvious switch? Was one day did someone say, well, here's a Street Fighter 2 tournament and there's a prize money? I mean, or was it not as easy to pin down? Like everything, not really, because the, uh, so much of what we do in video games, but like, like the, the used to happen in sport, still does to some degree, is, is community driven. In other words, a bunch of people get together. Once connectivity became um, possible, then it's possible for a bunch of people to get together and play the, their favourite game competitively. Now, mm. initially, they would have done that over local area networks, LAN networks. So, you know, a bunch of, bunch of kids arrive at, you know, somewhere and either plug their own computers in or they've got some, you know, they've got some consoles and they come together to play and they realise how great it was. Now, that is all, that all still happens, obviously, in the, in the flesh because that's what tournaments are. But as the internet becomes more and more um, usable and more reliable, um, then the, the prospect of massively multiplayer online games becomes a reality. Obviously, if you're playing for fun, that's one thing. Uh, if you're playing not for fun, but in a competitive tournament, then you've got to have the absolute level playing field in terms of accessibility. So there's no sense in your team playing Call of Duty for you, know, you, you and three mates playing in a, in a squad of four of Call of Duty with a really bad in internet connection against a, a bunch of other mates because it's just, it's the most frustrating thing ever. I mean, it's just so poor. Well, so, yeah, I, actually, yeah. I don't know if you, if you uh, one of the things I taught myself, I teach myself, but tried to improve on in lockdown was my chess. And I decided to, to buy every chess book that Amazon had and watch every YouTube video unbelievable by the way if you're into chess youtube chess is just fucking huge <laughs> and one of the things that's come out of it of course is without any what you know what they call over the table chess to play um online tournaments have been massive and magnus carlson the, the world champion who's a brand in his own right has been partaking in and has actually hosted tournaments with big prize money and there has been the odd scandal because when you're playing bullet chess and it's three minutes or five minutes a game, if your internet connection's even just a fraction off, especially when they get to the porn endings and they're literally going like, so you can only imagine really big esports tournaments, you know, online when, when there's, and look, let's be honest, there's money on the line. Yeah. Uh, so, so do you think that, I mean, I remember I was a witness to this because the brief period I was at university and I couldn't stand it when I left, but the brief period I was there, they had just freshly installed what used to be known as a T1 connection in, uh, in the rooms. And the, the server was back on campus somewhere. And that was the, I mean, that was the Napster days, right? So the, the first yeah. advent of, of, of peer to peer uh, in any, of anything. And, um, and I remember playing the very first Call of Duty on that. And of course my internet crashing all the time because I was jumping onto servers in the States and it just wasn't ready for it yet. Do you think that that, because, I mean, I don't know if you've probably seen that documentary, The King of Kong on Netflix about the guy yeah. that, brilliant film, by the way. Yeah, um, but, you know, so people have been competitive with video games ever since they've begun, because like we are with everything. But do you think that internet thing, you know, the, the quality of connection is what took it up to where we are, or, you know, to, towards without, where we without are? Doubt, um, without doubt, Ollie. Uh, if you look at sort of, again, history's informative. Um, for years and years and years, the global games industry pretty much was global. And we in the West were always slightly confused by the, the market in Korea, South Korea, okay, not North Korea. 
And, you know, we used to go to sort of, we still do, we, we travel all over the world or used to, uh, to uh, until COVID and, uh, you know, to, to do deals. And South Korea was a weird market because we just didn't understand what games they were building. You know, highly technical, um, very highly skilled workforce, very informed, very high education, etc. And we didn't really understand the South Korean games at all. And we get South Korean companies come to like the West and say, please, can you help us sell our games? And it became obvious that I first went to South Korea, I think it was about mm, 20 years ago, something like that. It became obvious there was no boxed, you know, physical goods market in South Korea at all back then. And I thought, well, why is that? You know, we, we were sort of, we, it was the early days of the internet for us. And the reason why, it was probably 18 years ago, actually, it's 2002. The reason why um, there was no kind of box that everyone was online in South Korea was because they had massive pipes, fat pipes, right, which were wiring up the whole country. And they kind of just made games that were, by design, multiplayer, massive multiplayer games. And that's what they did. And StarCraft, to this day, is still, um, it's almost like, nobody can get close to the South Korean teams. So what, what happened was a whole generation of players grew up that were able to understand more about online and, and that dynamic than necessarily playing, let's say, a single player game where, you know, you might play Call of Duty, for example, back when it first came out and Medal of Honor came out, you know, was the, was, was the sort of groundbreaker around 2000 that Electronic Arts made and then some a couple of years later, Call of Duty came out from Activision. Same sort of game. They won't like me saying that, but it was the same kind of game. And there was a lot of fashion around World War II there, which was tied into um, Saving Private Ryan, funnily enough. Um, so, but, but in South Korea specifically, it was, there was a whole, effectively, generation of really skillful players who were able to play online. And at, actually, South Korea to this day, if you were to pick the country that's produced the most esports stars, then it would be South Korea. Okay. Well, I, I, I remember I was in Seoul a couple of years ago for uh, the Asian Racing Conference, and uh, I, I knew a little bit about South Korean esports. And, you know, for people that don't know, in, in a place like Seoul and any of their other big cities, there are thousands of esports cafes, right? Thousands of these things. On every street corner, you see the sign, and kids are... I think they, they do like the drinking and all the stuff that British kids like doing. But you know what they like more, I think, is hanging around late at night in, in their esports cafes. And these places are like, you're not talking like dingy. This is up to date stuff with food and beverage and the rest. I mean, these are, and this is obviously the culture you're referring to. People have yeah. grown up with this interconnectivity rather than maybe in our culture. It was certainly when I played as a kid and you're talking about in the, mid 90s games of which i mentioned on my last podcast with nikita was super nintendo and street fighter 2 you know was yeah. a ball game changer of all time for me but that was bedroom gaming and it's absolute yeah. you know our, our mates would come over to play whereas clearly you're saying about five or six years later in in, in south korea these guys did that except they did it out amongst each other with interconnected machines yeah, and, and the and the internet, the, the 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 investment that the country of South Korea made into the internet was was big, and it was early. Um, and for years, I've I've spent time, you know, working with government in the UK and trying to get the government to understand that you know our digital economy, right? The digital the digital economy act of two thousand and ten, right, was a was a landmark um, piece of legislation. And I would argue that we haven't really done very much since then. In the last 10 years, our investment as a country in our digital infrastructure has been, well, woeful. Well, right? I'll, tell you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you it's shit. So years ago, <laughs> before, before I got involved in interesting things, when I, when I did leave school, I worked in IT uh, to begin with at a big bank. And um, you, learn, you learn quite a lot working in that, in that sector at the time, especially, I mean, you're talking... In, I did my work experience when, you know, four meg of RAM in the machine was huge, you know, 
But what I can tell you about infrastructure and for, for the listeners that don't know, and I'm not going to get into the technical side of it, but still largely, and in back then, all of your data signaling, especially with telephony, is, is something going down a copper wire. Uh, yeah. and, and the very basics of telephony were copper wires. Now, you'll look out of your window, and if you're lucky enough, you might find a big green box on the corner, which is generally maintained by British Telecom or one of their subsidiaries. That box traditionally contained loads and loads of copper wires that would connect to a, main, to a, a, a general grid that would be to another set of copper wires somewhere in London, most likely, et cetera, et cetera. I can see from my house as we speak a BT station with the same copper wire box. Now, that end-to-end -end is still carrying my phone signal. And in turn, my, my internet quality relies on the phone signal. Now, plenty of people, especially in rural areas, have still got copper-to-copper -copper boxes. You know, no, you're talking about South Koreans laying big pipes. Well, the reason you said big, because the size is the capacity is important. You can carry a signal the bigger it is. And, and I, I'm with you. And I think it, the, the amount of investment has been, it's been diabolical when you consider the, the, the growth of, of internet companies. Let's not even you know, get into the, the market of Amazon and the rest of them, but the entire business is built on connectivity. And we yeah. need, right now, more than any other time, we needed that. And there are people that have sat through lockdown with dodgy internet connections. You can't do Zoom calls. Uh, there's no reason for it, right? In 2020 is my point. And interestingly enough, at the beginning of all this, because we're involved, uh, some of the things I do in the games industry, you know, does involve dealing with uh, government departments. Um, and the games industry comes under the, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, which is DCMS. And um, uh, it's actually digital culture, media and sport. Yeah, I, 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 I yeah. still, to this day, I'm slightly miffed that they bundled all of these incredibly different <laughs> things together like digital culture and sport on oh, naturally they go together i mean it's just let's not get onto that otherwise we'll end up but the the your your, your listeners may laugh or, or cry um do you know what we spent time right at the beginning of covid discussing could games companies please turn down their size of their files because they were worried the government were worried about the internet falling over i mean wow. talk wow. about Honestly, to, uh, Liz, we, I know that there's political sensitivity around Huawei and 5G, but all I'll say is, you know what? We were slow with the digital fiber revolution. You know, there was a prime minister in the 80s who will remain nameless, but she was female. And <laughs> she, did not, she, she, she did not get beat. DBT missed the boat and we yeah. put ourselves back. This country is amazing. UK is amazing because it's so innovative. But it would be nice to have the tools. With 5G, okay, we are on the brink of something truly amazing. You, know, you want to talk about connectivity. You want to talk about people playing, talking, having fun virtually and in the flesh. 5G is like, it's off the scale. It's not the difference like 3G to 4G was 1G, right? We all get that. Yeah. 4G to 5G is 500G. That's, that's the scale. People can't even begin to understand why it's going to affect their life. And yet I walk out of my door and I walk around, you know, like everybody else. And you see everyone gazing at their phone, exchanging all sorts of information. People who would never have thought that was ever going to happen a number of years ago, five, six years ago, even now it's ubiquitous. We've all got our smart devices. And if we haven't got them or indeed our access to the internet, we feel denuded, we feel cheated. Okay. It's a matter of absolute urgency that the UK gets itself into a place where it's truly leading or at least equal with some of the big players. The UK's e-commerce industry is amazing. We've got amazing um, innovation and entrepreneurship, startups all over the shop. We're amazing in tech, but we've got the worst infrastructure. We're 17th in the world. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, before I got into sport, I, I worked in development and um, we did a very large development project in Rwanda. And um, Rwanda was a chosen place because, well, for a few reasons, but one, one of the main reasons was because its cell phone network and the infrastructure they put in place is better than the UK's. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could get 3G signal. Uh, at the edge of Lake Kivu, where just over the other side of the lake, 
there's bullets whizzing around and it's pretty lawless. Uh, and, and in Kigali, I could get a better, I can't, still now in 2020, I can't get a signal upstairs. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and, and I'm 60 miles from London. And you know what? I knew a guy that worked at Vodafone and I did ask him one. I said, why, why is there this sort of black spot around Marlborough? I live in the West Country. There's this sort of black spot. He goes, there's just not enough people here to warrant us putting up a tower. And you're like, what the, f you know, where the government pressure should be on that. You know, it should be on holding well, some of these companies to account. Cause you're right. Look, this 5G is going to change everything. But if you can't get a signal, you can't pick it up. It's going to leave a load of well, people behind. I think, you know, aside from the kind of conspiracy theories and tin hats around 5G masks calling, causing COVID in the first place, and all that <laughs> kind of rub, the bottom line is with, with our infrastructure, you know, we have a government who is going to, who is plowing ahead on 120 billion pounds and counting on a railway that's not going to run until the end of the 2020s. Just get that right. Yet we've spent a few billion, two or three in 10 years on our digital infrastructure, which by the way, everybody needs to use. Look at the, look at the, the mess that schools are in. And most of the kids in the tough areas, the deprived areas, haven't got connection to the internet, haven't got laptops, right? So they're at a massive disadvantage. And yet the richer kids, sorry, sorry folks who are listening to you if you're rich, they're fine. You know, they've got, they've got the kit, they've got the access, they've got the internet, they've got the, the laptop, they know how to use it. We, this is a matter of national urgency. And it, it's like, you know, Britain had some kind of crazy empire because it controlled the seaways. We, we need to be able to compete by having amazing infrastructure. And that isn't more roads, and it isn't more railways, and it isn't more jets arriving at Heathrow. It might be a bit of that stuff, but I'll tell you now, it has to be. Digital has to be a priority. Well, it, it, if, if, if ever we went, needed it, Lee, if ever we needed to see that, these last four months of, of the COVID lockdown, right there. Exactly, and that's what I was going to say. If ever there would be more evidence to say, let's put a hold on the railway, because I don't need <laughs> to travel from Birmingham to Leeds or, or whatever it is so quickly. If I've got an amazing signal, I can speak to you face-to-face -face from my hand. Uh, the, in fact, you just you proved my point that traveling two hours each way for one meeting is not efficient in any way, shape or form, let alone the sustainability issues and so on. Look, uh, we like two men in a pub would probably rage on about this all day. What just to bring uh, bring things back and it's still look, it's still in the same topic area for, for our listeners who are. I did this with Nikita the other day, you know, who aren't familiar with with professional esports. And yeah. I think. We tried to make a distinction between, you know, gaming, esports, uh, and so on and so forth. Where do you think esports is headed? Because I'm—I don't know about you, and you must drive you nuts. But every day on LinkedIn and other platforms, you know, I'm hearing another so and so esports is the way to go. To, well, I think we've all established this a while ago. It's, a, it's an industry in its own right, and I think it doesn't need this highlighting all the time. But maybe the people in it want to, you know, keep making that noise. What? Where's esports going for you? Do you think? you know, really and truly uh, as, as the generation grows up, that esports teams could be as popular as sports teams as we know it. Uh, and likewise for the competitors. I mean, is that, and, and also is that, is that where you personally would like to see it going or do you like it where it is now? I mean, what's your general vibe? So I think that the point of reference with esports always seems to be the world of sport, you know, what we would call traditional sports. So let's just, let's just sort of, let's just accept that for a moment. I think there's some couple of very, very major differences. Number one, take football. Most people are aware of football. Most people will know about the FIFA World Cup. Most people will, will probably know about the Champions League. And most people will know about Barcelona and Real Madrid and Manchester United, blah, 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 right? The difference in football to the world of esports is very fundamental outside of the physical side of things. It's that nobody owns football, right? So no one owns it. If, you, if, if Ollie and Andy want to start a football team, Ollie and Andy can do that tomorrow. We can just go and do it. And we can go and play in a league somewhere. But in the, in the world of esports, which are video games, people own the games. So Call of Duty, Dota 2, uh, Rocket League are owned by companies. And that is an incredible responsibility for those companies. Most of them, to date, didn't set out 
to dominate the world of esports. It's it's slightly accidental, okay? Because the communities have formed, and the communities are a mix of players and viewers, and you can be both or either. Um, and those communities are formed around the video games, and that is what people care about: is those games. Obviously, there's organisations that are going to make teams that are going to use their expertise, their finance to ensure they've got the best players and they keep them, you know, conditioned and mentally right and all the rest of it. And they're going to play in leagues and there'll be league organisers that, that, that do that really well. But fundamentally, the, the video game company owns the game and whatever they say at the end of the day goes. And do you know what? They've got absolute control over that. Why? Because they can just turn you off. If they don't like what you're doing, if you go and build a renegade league somewhere and start behaving let's say in a questionable fashion then you know the owner of that video game just says just switch those guys off because just, ultimately just, for, just for people's reference so if um let's say it's dota 2 at the moment if someone wanted to set up a tournament they they would have to pay for the right to use it in, in, in a sort of actually very much like traditional media if you want to use that that game you pay the maker of the game and they allow you to use it for your tournament purposes. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you might, you, it might start off without paying. You might just apply for a community license right. on the basis that it's Andy, Ollie and a bunch of friends who want to play. And the, 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 the game owner says, no problem. Here's a community license. It costs nothing. Here's the sort of best practice. Here's what we expect code of conduct wise, but off you go. Now, as soon as you start to attract money or controversy or both, then the publisher of the game, the owner of the game, is going to have something to say about it. And they'll, they'll come knocking eventually. But the difference is, this is digital. So actually, all of the data can be viewed anyway by the owner of the game. Simple as that. Okay, Because mm -hmm. if you're playing online, that's how it works. So there are some differences. In terms of where it's all going, there's a huge amount of heat, which is code for money, coming into the, um, into the world of esports by all sorts of people investors, other brands, other organized sporting organizations who can see that that might be where their audience is. Ultimately, it's, it's driven by who's playing, who's watching, okay? Because ultimately, all of the organizations that are gonna monetize the space are gonna need to be fully aware of who's playing and, and who's watching. Because if they're not, they've got no audience and they've got no monetization. Is there a, is there a bit of wild west about it? I mean, yeah. my, the, my, you know, main point of reference with, with a lot of this comes from the gambling industry and betting. And I, I saw at the, again, I mentioned this with Nikita at the ice, the big gambling conference back in February, uh, a, a, a large number of bookmakers, uh, putting esports rights and, and the, and the ability to play and gamble on, on video games uh, at their booths and you know as well as I do um, if people are playing games then someone's betting on it somewhere and that's no different uh, with esports I'm sure is that is that a worry for the industry because as you say uh, if something questionable is happening they can press the button to turn it off but the damage may already be done is it a worry it's a good question I mean I, I think that again we're seeing in the world of traditional sport how much data is now being used. So conditioning around players, um, you know, the top teams have all got their players, their data feeds from their players, their activity, their, you know, their movements, all that kind of stuff. Well, it's like that in video games, but, but, but to, to, the, to the power of half, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. So actually there's a really interesting um, paradigm here where um, generally speaking, the video games industry is very suspicious of the gambling industry. And generally speaking, at the moment, the video games owners are pretty anti-gambling. But, you know, life is life. And as you said, where there's a game, there's a bet. But the, the corruption side of things that happens in life, actually, as a, as a player, if you're... If you're playing below your, what's expected because of the, you know, the data bank on you as a player, so Ollie playing, mm. if you were to progress in the top areas of, of, a, of a top video game, you know, remains nameless, but you know, chess, so you, you, you're playing. 
you're unlikely to be able to sort of be the odds on you beating a top player because of the data feeds are going to be fairly massive, right? And, and, and actually, if you beat that person, there's going to be a case to answer to the, to the other player to say, well, your data feeds, your, all of your data movements don't look right, yeah. <laughs> okay? Because there's algorithms assessing what players are doing anyway. So we're in a completely different world now to a point actually where I think at the moment the gambling companies are looking at esports as a growth area. Why? Because that's what people are watching and what people are playing at a certain age. So they're looking and thinking, well, there's, there's going to be a great market. This will be amazing. You know, if it's like football, hey, great. You know, but when you actually get down to it, if you really think about this, if all of the data is being constantly <laughs> recorded by players and teams, the chances of making a market that's of any use to anybody actually start to decrease because yep. it should be incredibly predictable. These things do change in you know, like the big esports tournaments are like big sports tournaments. They're in an arena, 20,000 people, adrenaline kicks in, all of the form could go out the window because, you know, four on four or in the case of chess, one on one. And, yep. the, and actually other factors affect it. So I'm not saying it's completely um, predictable, but the areas where we, we look as an industry and think, well, let, let's look at, you know, potential match fixing, for example, and that sort of thing. Well, the data feeds really inform you. So you can say, well, look, actually, this is, there's a problem. In the same way that casinos will look out for their, for their big players and they'll know when the big players come in in you know, Las Vegas and they'll be watching those players and they'll go, that's it, that's it. We, we, we need to close that guy down. So that, that's going to be the same in video games. Yeah, I, and I'm, I'm with you on that. For me, and, you know, I work in horse racing. We've got a lot, uh, you know, there's a lot of heat. And from the wonderful culture, digital and sports department that, you know, that administer how racing gets a good portion of its money, but at the same time has to be wary of the image. My, my concern, and it doesn't because it bothers me, but my concern of what will happen in the esports industry is like anything, one day there will be someone or a team so popular that it benefits a, a betting organization to want to sponsor with them and money works and all the rest of it. And people will turn around and say, well, your audience is still a profile of, of this age to this demographic. And that's where you start to have problems, not necessarily in integrity, but in image. And this at the moment, esports is still really pure. I think it's still yeah. played and watched by people that are enthusiasts and it's not been tainted yet <laughs> and yeah. um the other sport you know the, you look you're a racing fan we we yeah. both love that game but you know it, it 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 does sometimes feel that the sport's so intrinsically linked with the betting that you that you don't think of anything else and look it's 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 more just a a, a point you know there are people with huge online followings who you know, will will have a lot of power and say in the next the next period going forward. And and those companies look betting companies are perfectly legit, by the way, in this country and they all need to market themselves. I've no problem with that. It's it's more a question of what's the next thing. And um I noticed I and I saw at, at ICE um one of the very well known betting rights distribution companies marketing live battle um fighting games from Vegas one-on-one -on -one with people literally jumping on as you rightly say they use their data as a, as a way to make the market you're talking short odds fairly yeah. uninteresting but you know there'll be someone somewhere who wants to bet yeah I mean, just the same as you bet on mexican third division football if you go on to bet 365 i mean right i don't know how your knowledge is man but so anyway it's, it's just a it's just a point really because as the industry gets bigger it's just going to attract this sort of attention well, and, and i'll take you back to um the fundamental difference as i see it is the ownership and if you look at some of the um the top franchises now games wise and the leagues that are being constructed um take the call of duty league for example uh, it, it's very very heavily structured it's very heavily controlled by activision blizzard who, who own the game and their view is that they will control pretty much all of the rights around that over time, okay? Um, if teams that, if the franchise teams that are bought in to get into the league um, 
perhaps want to get, you know, like a gambling sponsorship, I would imagine that the owner of the game will have something to say about it. And it might just be that they decide they're not going to take that sponsorship money. That doesn't mean they can stop the free world from betting on what's going on, Mm -hmm. but they won't necessarily be seen to be taking it. Football clubs at the moment, um, you know, it's not so secret, is it? But look at the Premier League. Most of the sponsorship is, is gambling companies. And it's because it's a global game with global reach and that, that's the way it works. But, you know, th- there's an uneasy relationship between the gambling world and the football world. And the football teams take the sponsorship because it's real money coming in and they need to drive as much revenue as they possibly can to get that completely. But, you know, that's because it's a kind of sort of almost like a a tribute because the 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 gambling companies are making a market and currently the premier league or fafa or uefa can't actually prevent them from making a market that's going to happen in in esports no doubt about it but i wonder in esports if that whether whether the gambling companies will be able to get into the teams in the really big stuff Right. Yeah, that's a good Which point. Then might, 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 make, might make them go to challenger areas and they might actually be more, that might be more dangerous because it could go into less well-organised and less well-structured organisations and, and leagues. But again, I'll come back to the owner of the game will have something to say about it and they can. Yeah, and I, that, that fundamental difference does allay, you know, I, I imagine a lot of fears that people have and it, it, it allows a, a bit of control. Look, the problem with, you know, we'll get onto football now. We're, we're both passionate football fans. But the issue that, the issue that football clubs have, and I, you know, I work in partnerships uh, and deal with sponsors all the time and all that stuff, their commercial model is, is not broken, but it's just bad. Yep. It costs too much money to run a premiership football club. Therefore, you take the highest bidder when it comes to your, your partnership assets. I've talked about this a lot on LinkedIn, that what we're doing in Racing League is different. We're starting from scratch. I'm able to choose the best partner for the fans because we're funded in a different way. West Ham, Spurs, whatever, they don't have this luxury. If you're the commercial director at West Ham, and XY Bet comes along with 10 million, and even if it was Facebook and they've given you five, the guy's taking the 10 because he's got to pay. I I totally agree. And I think, look, I also think that you've got, a real um, diametrically opposed paradigm here with football clubs because um, take the Premier League, certainly the top five or six clubs are the top five or six brands and they're huge brands with massive followings, but they don't make a lot of money compared with some of the games companies. No, the turnover. If you look at what these clubs are turning over. Yeah, it's because the, the, the... the way they can monetize their communities is actually, is actually quite limited. You know, it's mm-hmm. ticket sales, it's shirt, spon- it's shirt sales and kit sales, it's TV money, and it's a bit of commercial, you know, sort of entertainment stuff. And, you know, well, you I can't, look at- you, the, the, the problem, it's not a problem. The, the, the fact is, one of the best, so Liverpool is probably the best club on social media in the UK, Barcelona and Madrid, obviously in a different league. Barcelona, and Real Madrid will have probably 30, 40, 50, 60, whoever knows, millions of followers on, on Facebook. A vast majority of those can't even afford to buy a shirt, let alone have it reach them. You know, again, back to Rwanda, you wander around rural, like really rural Rwanda, and you'll see a, a fake Madrid shirt on someone, but they can't afford, <laughs> let alone go onto the online store. They don't have the connectivity. So, They'll do the Facebook like because that's as close as that's their thing. I'm now a Madrid fan and monetizing that is really hard. And, you know, I was actually amazed when uh, I am a Spurs fan. It's out there. But I was amazed when I saw Spurs have made a hundred odd million pound profit. And this is like a, a record. Yeah. A hundred billion quid. Yeah. You know, in, in, I, 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 I could name, I won't, but I could name 25 different games companies. Who yeah. No one's ever heard of who yeah. made that. I know, uh, and, and, and this is the thing, but it, the, the thing's broken, in my opinion, because there's nowhere to go now. The, yeah. the players, at, they deserve to be paid whatever they can make. I've no problem with that, but it, it, it's, it's too much for the clubs to bear. And we've seen clubs go out of business. I mean, Leeds United coming back into the premiership, 
is a good story for football because they're a big club and all that. But they, you know, they pissed it up the wall like a bunch of drunken sailors. I mean, throwing money at trying to get Champions League glory and all the rest of it. Blackburn. Yeah, Blackburn, yeah. I mean, I, th- I feel that, Ollie, you're absolutely right. There's, it's, it's, it's a, it, your brain aches when you try and analyse how football... It, and that's why it ends up becoming the rich... You know, it's the plaything of the rich because, you, you know, like my club, West Ham, it's an open secret that our owners, let's just say I'm not their number one fan, <laughs> but, but they, they are desperate to sell the club for big, big money, okay? Like there's legal restrictions around the Olympic Stadium or the whatever they're calling the stadium this week, London Stadium, Olympic Stadium. There, there are some legal, you know, gateways that they've got to get through. But look, it, it's pretty obvious. It'll be an either an American business consortium, probably would have been Chinese up until a couple of weeks ago. That's all changed now. Yeah. Um, might have been Russian, but that's all changed. And could be Arab. You know, that, that, they're, the, they're the places. That, they're, 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 that's what's going to end up with our football clubs. And, and if you look at, I mean, it's an open secret that Abramovich wants to sell Chelsea. He wants three billion. There's a big deal on the table, 2.5 at the moment. He's not budging. That, that's an open secret. For most people seem to know in the industry. And, and you look at it and think it's going to be a long payback. But I suppose if you've got incredibly rich individuals, this is their biggest chance to get on the world stage to run a Premier League football club. And you look at the clowns that bought Blackburn, for example, you know, absolute, you, you know, clowns that thought that let's buy this club because this will give us the gateway to be like famous and to, this, sell, you know, and to sell chickens in, in the UK. Chickens. I mean, it's just, yeah, just cry. It just makes us all cry. I, I think with video games, fundamentally, um, the esports industry it has grown out of the video games industry, and video games are monetizable a number of different ways, not least by buying content within the game to in, enhance your experience. And the great thing about games, I'm, I'm not just saying it because I'm a games person, but I kind of am, is that you can play games nowadays for free and you, we still don't have games where you're effectively playing, paying to win, right? You, you're, you, if you look at Fortnite, one of the most successful games on the planet and has been for three years, you know, it's a free game. All of their monetization is geared around fashion. It's around skins. It's around extra kick that just makes you feel good and look good and with your mates. Doesn't make you any good better at Fortnite. So there's a purity there that works for the owner of Fortnite, Epic Games, who are in turn partially owned by Tencent, who are one of the biggest media companies in the in the world. No one's ever heard of from China. Um, and you know, Epic have made a colossal amount of money out of Fortnite, and they've got no plans to. Um, necessarily let the betting world get in on it or anything else or take any lectures from the ioc you know or indeed fifa or any of these august bodies that that epic have got their own views about fortnite they've run their fortnite world cup and that's it they're doing it and they're they're getting out and they're making money why because those games are hugely successful and people can pay some money so to, to your point about you know, the Facebook likes and all the rest of it. Within games, you're able to, to take part, you put your life and soul into it. As a kid, as a young person, as an old person like me, you put your time into it and you can take your choice what you want to buy. And yeah. the games that are successful are the ones that monetize through their community. And most importantly, the community does not resent it. I'm a West Ham season ticket holder. You know, we'll probably confirm that we're staying in the Premier League, which is the double-edged sword. And guess what will pop through into my inbox will be, hey, here's your season ticket renewal. And it won't be any cheaper. Mine's okay. already come. Mine, <laughs> we, mine came uh, fucking three or four weeks ago. And, and they want 20% up front. They want 20% up front. And, then, and, and by the way, we, we don't even think we're going to be back to the stadium this year. So I, I, well, we don't know when we're going back, do we? So, no, I, just, but I, I, just, I felt like writing back. The thing is, there's no one there to write to. I felt like saying, Daniel... <laughs> Daniel, I, I don't know if you're aware, I'm, you can't sell me a ticket for an event that's not happening. Yeah. And I understand well. they need the money. Again, Eric Dyer's just signed a new contract. They need to pay him. They need his signing on fee. And it's cash. A lot of this stuff is all about liquidity as well. You know, these aren't businesses I, that are sitting on files, files of cash. There's none. You know, this is why the transfer window is such a popular thing because it's the first, you know, actual money moves around. Everything else is amortized assets and all this stuff. You know, Tottenham yeah. being worth this, Chelsea. 
Chelsea being worth three billion. They can't, you know, the planning permission to build the theatre. You know, it's crazy all this stuff. But well, it's a mad world. I mean, I think I think our world of esports, video games, and esports is likely to have other areas of massive controversy and areas to watch out for. But I do think we're in a different place because it's a global, digitally connected audience, and it's never been like that before. Yeah. Um, funny enough, the, one of the most successful teams, you talk about li li liquidity, the, one of the most successful teams in esports is Team Liquid. I think yeah. last year they earned over $10 million in prize money alone. That's without any, uh, that's from just price, price pots. Yeah, and then this is early days for those guys. Very too. early, very early. I mean, the, early. When, when consumer brands, uh, the, the thing that it is, you know, without getting fully into the whole marketing geek hat on, but when the great thing about well for brands about esports is that they're going to have a loyal following that's that's grown up as as the industry's grown up and as those people grow up into adults and have spending power they're going to keep using it with the brands they know from these days and totally that, I mean, you're absolutely right and it's it's a bit like old school football fans like me you know we we had no choice about which football club we supported it was just like my dad said you're west ham that's it right? yeah. okay my granddad said you're west ham thanks i haven't and, with my dad for years because of this <laughs> and but but the point the point i'm making is that that football's only become a, a real money 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 game in the last sort of 20 25 years before that it was a community game and yeah. Now there's still a lot of heat in football because the community bit has been ignored. Funnily enough, COVID's proved, if ever we needed proof, that the players and the game need fans in the stadium. They need the fans in the stadium because the atmosphere is not there. Um, and we as fans have been overlooked for a long time. Big problem from football is that they overlook their fans. And Completely. in video games, the, 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 the game owners do not overlook the fans because the community is absolutely everything in video games. That's the one thing I'd say to the world of sport is don't ever forget your community. Yeah, and look, I, one of the reasons we started the Racing League and CHR, uh, not that many people listen to this know all about the details of that, but one of the reasons, one of the key founding principles was that fans, you know, especially in football, do not get a good deal out of their fandom. You're, and And they've never been more disconnected and COVID would prove that when pit payers who have paid incredible amount of money didn't see the way to furloughing themselves and they couldn't survive on the two and a half grand a month. You know, it, never in history have a bunch of people made themselves less popular um, with people that worship them, if that makes any sense. Um, Andy, look, I know time's sticking on. We could carry on this all day. I'm sure we will in a pub in the future. We do ask a question of everyone that comes on the show. Um, and that is, what is your favourite type of dog? Labrador. No messing, just straight, straight, straight in. to the point. Okay, so we answer that question mainly as a psychoanalysis because some people have very different needs with their dogs. Other people spend hours describing, you know, their childhood. But what, what's the Labrador for you? What's in it? What? Why the lab? Uh, always been an iconic dog. Uh, every Labrador I've ever met has been really friendly really loving and will run and run and run all day long they'll eat everything they can lay their mitts on um but Are you describing got... julian dix or a dog <laughs> be julian dix no julian dix is a rottweiler but <laughs> yeah, I, that's true yeah. i absolutely love julian dix if you're, if you're listening julian i really i do admire you as a player don't take that the wrong way <laughs> I loved, it, loved it what a left foot he had yeah he um, did yeah good he probably had a left and a right a right hook as well but anyway yeah. um, no labrador's just just they, they just love you you know and um let, listen we all want to be loved yeah true okay mate look thanks very much for popping in uh, it's been great fun as always we didn't even manage to get on to, to racing and all that but i tell you what maybe we'll do that once uh, covid's over we'll we'll get back on and uh, see how as an owner of horses i'm looking forward to getting back to racing yeah. um yeah i'm really looking forward to it the last time we met in person was at the children festival which should yeah. never have gone ahead <laughs> no i know and uh as my sense of smell is telling me every day for the last four months, I should not have gone there. Um, on that note, we're going to leave it. Um, hope you have a good day, Andy. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Thanks, Ollie.